You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Well, if you would take your Bibles at this time and turn to 2 Corinthians, or sorry, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. I know we, we just looked at chapter 15 here in the scripture reading. We're going to pick it up where the scripture reading left off in verse 20. So again, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to look at verses 20 through 28. As we come here to this passage on this Resurrection Sunday, in this passage, uh, in this letter, uh, Paul has been, the Apostle Paul has been both addressing issues in the church that have been reported to him by those in the household of Chloe, and he's also responding to questions that have been written to him from the church as well. And this has been a a church that has really given Paul trouble. Uh, It is a church that has become carnal and divided. And so Paul, through this letter, is addressing all kinds of things that have caused division within the church, and he's pointing them to where their unity must be, and their unity as the body of Christ. And so spurring on some of the issues that were there in the church was, one, the, the surrounding culture there in the city of Corinth, but, but most of all, it was the false teachers that had wormed their way into the church. And among the many sinful and doctrinal issues in the church that Paul was addressing, the specific one that we must consider for this morning is the denial of the resurrection. Now, just to be clear, the Corinthians were not denying that Christ himself had been raised from the dead, that he was resurrected. What they questioned was whether or not there was a resurrection for them, whether or not believers would be resurrected one day. And so the Apostle Paul makes his argument for the resurrection, as we see here in the text, and as we already started to look at, as as Ken read the, the scripture reading before. We saw Paul begins this section reminding the Corinthians of the gospel, reminding the Corinthians of what is essential, uh, of what is of first importance, uh, that which we cannot equivocate on, that which we cannot just agree to disagree on, uh, that which we cannot miss and yet still rightly call ourselves Christians. He reminds them of that, that we will go to the mat defending Because it is of primary importance. And again, what is of primary importance? The gospel of Jesus Christ. That which he proclaims starting there in verse 3 when he says that Christ died for our sins in accordance to the scriptures. That he was buried and on the third day rose again in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to, and he lists those that Christ appeared to in his resurrection to Peter, see, he says they're Cephas, and to the other t- apostles, and to James, and, and eventually, as, as Paul says, one untimely born, as he refers to himself, that he appeared to Paul. And so Paul's arguments are, first, Christ's resurrection is a necessary part of the gospel. And also, two, Christ's resurrection is a historical fact And then he says that Christ's resurrection is the very basis for our hope of resurrection. Paul shows that through the resurrection, through Christ's resurrection, we are guaranteed to rise again. And what we won't get to in this passage here this morning, we'll see that that Paul goes on to talk about the resurrection and what the resurrection body is like. Uh, that the resurrection and the power of God brings a change, a transformation to fit the believer body and soul for their eternal dwelling with God. And so believers will be raised just as Christ has been raised. The sting of death struck. The blow of death fell on Christ as Christ suffered and satisfied the wrath of God, paying the price for the sins of all who would believe on him. But not only has Christ died, but he is alive. He has risen. 
And what hope is that for us? As we live in such a chaotic world, as we live in a time where nothing is certain, which really is every time in this fallen sinful world, as we live and we experience death in our lives, we experience the death of loved ones, and we may one day ourselves experience our own deathbed, what hope is it to know that Jesus is alive? And because Jesus lives, we will live as well. We have such a great hope, such a great future, a future that apart from Christ is dismal, is hopeless. But the hope we have in Christ because he lives, and he does live, and since Christ has been raised, so too we, even if we die, we will live to never die again. Now, really, too, as we examine the scriptures, and we'll mention again later, really, in the end, all will be raised. Even those who do not trust in Christ will be raised one day, but they will be raised to everlasting condemnation, to endure God's wrath and the penalty for their sins forever. But this passage that we look at this morning focuses on those who will be raised who have trusted in Christ. Those who trust this gospel, who trust in Christ alone to save them. Their sin has been already paid for in Christ's sacrifice. And so they will rise and rise to eternal life in the glory of their God. So again, the resurrection, the resurrection is true. The Corinthians, they may have argued that there was no resurrection of the dead, but Paul argues that if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, you are still in your sins. There is no hope. There is only the expectation of judgment and wrath. And so that's where Paul leaves off. That's where Ken read up to. And so we pick it up here again in verse 20. And so if you would, read with me, starting in verse 20, as we read through verse 28. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. So as we we go through this passage, uh, there, starting in verse 20, uh, that verse begins by saying, But, and that contrasting conjunction uh, is just great here. Uh, It is contrasting everything that would be true if Christ had not been raised. Again, Paul explains, if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised, and there is no hope. Uh, There's, it's just, it's all dismal. It's all fearful. It's all... It's bad. I don't know, what other adjective can I use? If Christ has not been raised. And, and so let's go back uh, to everything Paul was saying leading up to this verse. Go back to verse 14 and seeing all of the despair and all the hopelessness that Paul describes if Christ has not been raised. Again, verse 14. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. They are even found to be misrepresenting God, 
because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. In other words, we're pathetic. If we're just holding on to this, this idea and the story of Christ just to give us hope for the here and now, what is that? It's nothing for this fleeting life. If Christ has not been raised, which again is not the argument the Corinthians were making, but it is the logical conclusion to the argument they were making, If Christ has not been raised, then all is depressing, it's horrible, it's futile. Our situation is hopeless. Verse 20, but. But, in fact. In actual, absolute, historical fact, Christ has been raised. He is alive. Paul says he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, those who have died He's the first fruits. He, he, he is the first one to die, to rise again, to never die again. He is the first one to rise in the resurrection glorified body. Because of Christ, for those of us, he saves. It is not all doom and gloom, but it is glorious hope of eternal life with our Lord. How great is that? Now, the reference that Paul makes here to Christ being the first fruits, there in verse 20, it's a, it's a reference to the Feast of Weeks or Feast of Harvests that we see there in the Old Testament, which was one of three Jewish festivals that required Jews, no matter where they lived, required them to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival. We may know this festival better as Pentecost. The word Pentecost means 50th. Because this was celebrated 50 days after presenting the first stalks of grain of the harvest on the day after the Passover Sabbath. Uh, This is when uh, the first portion, the first fruits of the harvest was offered to the Lord. And it was both an example of the rest of the harvest to come, so what the rest of the harvest would be like, and it was also a sign of the guarantee of the rest of the harvest. And so that's what Paul is saying Christ is. He's the first fruits. He's one, the example of what the rest of the resurrection harvest, if you will, will be like. That as Christ has been raised to never die again, so those who rise after him will never die again. As Christ has been raised in the resurrection glorified body, so those who rise after him will be raised in the resurrected glorified body. His resurrection is an example of what is to follow. And it is also the guarantee of what is to follow. His resurrection is the guarantee of our resurrection. So we can trust the resurrection is true. The harvest is coming. Christ is the first fruits, and we are the rest of the harvest. We are the full harvest. And what hope we have when we trust in Christ to save us. Because apart from that, we have no hope because we are sinners. And sin brings death, both physical death and eternal death, spiritual death, eternal separation from God to know nothing but his wrath. This is our condition through our first representative, our first parent, Adam. Adam who sinned. As a result, death was introduced to the human race. Because sin was introduced to the human race. So our our natural condition is being in Adam, represented by Adam, who is a sinner. And so we who follow Adam, who are in Adam, are sinners. That we in ourselves have earned death, have sinned and violated God's holy law. And we have to understand that we, we do not, we are not sinners because we sin. No, the the teaching of God's word is that we sin because we're sinners. We are sinners in Adam. 
That's who we are. And so death comes to us all in Adam. But for those who have faith in Christ, all who are in Christ, who have Christ as their representative by faith, those who believe, they're made alive. Death does not get the last say for those whom Christ represents. And Paul explains this in verses 21 and 22. He says, For as by a man, that's Adam, came death, by a man, that's Christ, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So one man brought the end result for all of those that man represents. Everyone in Adam, who's represented by Adam, which is the entirety of the human race, experiences death because of Adam's sin. Everyone represented by Christ through faith, so therefore are in Christ, are guaranteed resurrection due to Christ's life, death, and resurrection. So all in Christ will rise to have eternal life, never to die again, because Christ will never die again. So the resurrection for all who are in Christ is secure. And yet, as we see there in verse 23, the resurrection from the dead is in a particular order. And now Paul does not get into the details of that order and and how things are going to happen here. He he sums everything up, and he's making a particular point. But if we were to look to the whole of Scripture, we would see uh, that the harvest of the resurrection begins with Christ's resurrection, which secures the rest. And then what will follow first is the resurrection of the church, of those who have died believing in Christ, when Christ appears to take his church out of the world. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then those who are still alive in this world, part of the church, will then be caught up together with them in the air, and we will all be transformed, and we will all be fit to be with Christ, and we will be with Christ forever. Right? That's the hope that we read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'd argue, too, that's the hope we read about even as if we were to continue in this chapter here in 1 Corinthians 15. And then the next to be raised would be the tribulation saints and the Old Testament saints. And then those who die in the millennial kingdom, which as far as I understand, I want to make that preface, <laughs> that when it comes to those who die, even in the earthly reign of Christ, that they will die to be immediately resurrected. That it's almost like death is just a, an immediate transition into the resurrected, glorified body. And then here we read in verse 24, then comes the end. And again, Paul does not mention here the resurrection of the unrighteous. But what we do see here is that when those who belong to Christ are raised, then the end will come. After Christ, thousand-year reigns on this earth. And we see all of this necessitates Christ's resurrection. If Christ were not raised, he could not be then the risen king who will come again to rule and to reign and bring the end of all things. He would not return if he were dead. But he is not dead. He is alive. And he will return and reign and fulfill all of God's promises to Israel. And that's what he's going to do. He will come and establish his kingdom on earth and fulfill the promises that God made to Israel. All the prophecy that that has been foretold will be fulfilled in that day because he lives and he will return and he will reign on David's throne. See, who Jesus is, is God who came in the flesh. God who became a man. That's why he could be our representative. Because Adam was our our first parent. Adam being the first human represented all of us who followed. And so Christ came as a human to be the representative of all who would believe on him, to rescue us from that representation in Adam. 
And so Christ became a man to save us. And so as a man, he is a descendant of King David. And as a descendant of King David, he has the rights to David's throne. And he will come and reign on David's throne. And reign over the whole earth and fulfill the kingdom promises to Israel. Now, there are some who reject that. Uh, Reject that Christ will come and literally reign on this earth. Uh, Those whom I dearly love and and are true brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, Those whom I owe so much to and am so grateful for. Uh, But they reject that Christ will literally reign on this earth. Uh, They say that the, the promises to Israel have become null and void because Israel rejected their Messiah. And so now those promises are spiritually fulfilled in the church. And so they argue that that Christ's reign is now in the church and through the church, spiritually now. But I I reject that. (laughs) I would argue that is to drain the Old Testament text concerning Messiah's rescue of Israel and the promised kingdom to Israel. It's to drain those passages of of their meaning to the original audience. But you say, well, we're not in those Old Testament passages. We're in this passage. So what does this passage say? Because someone will look to this passage and say, see, see, there is no literal reign of Christ. Because what does it say here? It says that, that Christ will come, and then those who belong to him will be raised. Verse 24, then comes the end. See, it's, it's right away. Christ returns, the dead are raised, then the end. No millennial kingdom, no literal reign of Christ. It it's immediately goes to the end. Is that what this passage says? At a first glance, I think we can come away with that, but if we look a little deeper at the passage, I, I think it tells a different story. Michael Vlock, in his book, He Shall Reign Forever, points out that the Greek word translated here as then in verse 24 is used at times to show an interval of time between two events. So here in verse 24, it'd be between Christ's coming and the end. And a matter of fact, this word throughout this passage demonstrates an interval of time. Uh, For instance, in verse 23, it talks about the order of the resurrection beginning with Christ's resurrection. And if we were to look at a literal translation of this verse, or a wooden translation, it would read something like, the first fruits, Christ. Then, and and there's that word, then the ones who belong to Christ in his appearing, or you could say at his coming. As we read about that, we know that there is a time interval, that there's a span of time there. How, how do we know? There's a span of time between Christ's resurrection and his coming again, right? We know that because we're in that time right now. Where we sit at this very moment, Christ has been raised, but he hasn't come back again yet. And so that time interval is, is an interval of at least nearly 2,000 years. And also, Vlock goes on to point out that we also see this word being used like this even earlier in this chapter. After asserting in the beginning of this chapter that Christ rose on the third day according to the scriptures, we see there what he says in verses 5 through 8. And as you see here, I have in yellow where the Greek word that's in question here pops up. And so we see what Paul says. After saying Christ rose on the third day according to the scriptures, he says, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, he appeared to Cephas, then, and there's the word, then to the twelve. Verse six, then, there's the word again, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Now, just because we're, we touched on this and we're touching on it now, um, just let me go, go down a little 
bunny trail here. You know, it's Easter, right? I can go down a bunny trail. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think it's important enough to do so, though. To think about, why does Paul say that those who saw Christ most are still alive, though some have fallen asleep? What's significant about that? Well, what he's saying is, listen, Corinthians, Christ has indeed been raised, historically raised. And if you don't believe me, there are plenty of others you can go talk to. You can go investigate this for yourself and know the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, you can go talk to Peter or Thomas or Cleopas. There are others that have seen him. Yes, yeah, some, some have died, but there are plenty of those who can verify what I'm saying. You can go check it out for yourself. And Vody Bauckham points out the significance of this for us when he explains that the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. So what does that mean for us? As we're reading the scriptures and we read the testimony of those who proclaim Christ's resurrection, we read the epistles and we read the gospels, they were written by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of eyewitnesses. And so as they make their assertions, there was opportunity for others to rise up and say, hey, listen, I, I was there. I, I know what went down, and that's not it. That's not what happened. There's plenty of opportunity for kickback. And as we look at the historical record, it's silent. And even, you know, we're in Sunday school, we're, we're going through Acts, and, and we read about Peter's proclamation on the day of Pentecost of Christ's resurrection. And it would have been really easy for those, especially the Jewish leaders who opposed Peter's preaching and wanted him to stop, it would have been really easy to silence him because they knew where Jesus' body was supposed to be. And all they had to do was go get it and show it and say, see, he's, he's, he's dead. But they didn't because they couldn't. Christ is alive. And what we have is a historical record, not just of man, but of the very word of God. All right, let's get back to what we're talking about here. So, again, Paul says that Jesus appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then verse 7, then, and there's the word again, then he appeared to James. Then, and there's the word, to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So as we look at these verses, in some cases here, the word could be indicating an interval of time that is just a matter of hours. In verse 7, it would seem that it's pointing to what is a matter of days. And then as we've already said in verse 23, that is clearly a time period of what is, at least as of now, nearly 2,000 years. And so then we come to verse 24 and see the word then. Now what follows when Christ comes back and the dead are raised, then comes the end. But, but how much time is between when Christ comes and the end? And what happens during that time? I think it's pretty clear what happens during that time. It is the millennial reign of Christ. Christ will reign. And it's pretty clear, it's actually it's blatantly clear as you read this, that, that the reign of Christ, Christ's kingdom is in view, because verse 24 goes on and says, Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. So Christ will come and reign on this earth, and after Christ subdues all his enemies, and all that remain in rebellion to him is crushed, when every rebellion is under his feet, then the millennial reign of Christ will transition into the eternal state. Christ, who has been ruling, ruling on earth, as God's representative ruler, 
having won back the rule that was intended for Adam at creation, that Adam lost in his fall into sin. Christ succeeds at this. Christ subdues the earth, subdues all that's in rebellion to him, and then he turns the kingdom over to God the Father. And verse 25 says, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. He will reign until all powers, all rebellion is crushed under his feet. And the very last enemy, the very last one to be crushed under his feet that will usher in the end is what? Verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Christ's resurrection has already set this in motion and guarantees the victory here. Death, here as we see it read, is clearly an enemy, even as it's a consequence for our sin and our rebellion against our God, our King, and our Creator. And when we face death in this life, we face the death of a loved one, Again, if we find ourselves one day laying on our own deathbed, death feels like an invading enemy. But praise God, praise our great and awesome God, that the day is coming when death will be no more. The day is coming because we want to make sure we get this right. What is this saying? That death will be no more, that death will be destroyed. The day is coming when not only will no one ever die again, but no one will be dead. Death will be no more. Again, for all who trust in Christ, we are guaranteed our resurrection, and our resurrection will come and be like Christ's resurrection. But also, too, the day is coming when even the condemned, who have never trusted in Christ to save them, they will rise to everlasting damnation. They will be fitted to suffer the wrath and just penalty for their sin, not just spiritually, not just mentally, but to endure physical conscious torment for eternity, as their sins have earned them. We read about this in in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 26 to 29. And in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Because of Christ being the risen king, death is already a defeated enemy. And the day will come when death will be no more. So even now, for those who are trusting in Christ and who are saved, death does not have the final say. Death is not the end. Even for us now, death really is nothing more than just a doorway that brings those God has saved into his presence, into his glorious presence, with resurrection hope that one day we will stand complete and whole as our Savior is. We will stand before our Creator, body and soul, fitted to be with him for eternity. That's why the Apostle Paul can say at the end of this chapter, looking at verses 54 to 57, He says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has won this victory for us. It's because of Jesus we have this guarantee. Not because of us. Not because of anything we could do for ourselves. Jesus has won the victory. He gets all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. Though there are some who want to claim the victory for themselves. Who say that they will fit themselves for heaven. That because they are a good person, they have earned their place in God's heavenly kingdom. Are you one of those? You stand and say, no, I'm a good person. Of course I'm going to go to heaven. I'm a good person. Good according to whose standards? 
whose standard of good matters? Shouldn't it be the one who will, you will stand before to be judged whether or not you are a good person? Whether or not you are a righteous person? And our judge, our God, has made his standard clear in his law. And his law is such that we will not be able to look to it and say, look, I've kept it all. I've done it well. No, instead, as we read in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, it says, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Instead of looking to God's law to say, look how good I am. I've done a good job. No, when we look to God's law, we see how fall, how far short we have fallen how infinitely short of his glory we are. That we not, have not upheld his standard of good and righteousness. But instead, we are law breakers before our God. And so my friends, let's just look at the law. Let me ask you, has God been first in your life, been number one in your life and in your priorities and in the seat of affection in your life? Or have you put other things in the place of God in your life and therefore made those things your God? The very first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. Nothing is to be in competition with him. Have we done that? Have you taken God's name in vain uh, to use his name, the, the name of the holy God, and to use it like every other word to express Anger, or even to express gladness and excitement? Have you used his name like a curse? God said in Exodus chapter 20 that he will not acquit anyone who blasphemes his name. Have you ever committed adultery? Say, no, I've been faithful to my spouse. Maybe you might say, I'm not even married. But in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, if you even look with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. See, because God's standard is so high that he doesn't just judge our outward actions, he judges the condition and the intent and the motives of our hearts. And Jesus said that on the day of judgment, every thought and every careless word will be brought into account. And if this is God's standard, if this is the bar that is set, which of us can stand? None of us. Not one of us, we all stand before the infinitely holy God as guilty. And before the infinitely holy God, our sin is an infinite offense, and so therefore has earned an infinite wrath. We have no hope within ourselves. We, like Adam, have failed and have earned judgment for ourselves. But that's why Christ has come that's why he took on flesh and a human nature. That's why he laid down his life to rise up again on the third day. To pay, to satisfy God's wrath against the sins of those who believe on him. To pay the price with his death and rise again victorious over sin and death. And so now because of Christ, you and I can have that victory. And if we are trusting in Christ, we do have that victory. It is ours. It is a guarantee for us. And so my friends, if you're here and you have not put your trust in Christ alone to save you, I plead with you, do not wait. Know this victory now. Know it today. Know the love and the joy of our glorious God by trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. There is no hope outside of Christ. Come to him, believe upon him, and you will be saved. That's the good news. That's why this is worth celebrating. That's why it's worth celebrating not just once a year, but why the church gathers weekly and why we are a body together, that together we celebrate our great and awesome God and all that he's done for us. Trust in Jesus and you will be saved. That's the great hope we have because Jesus is alive. The victory is sure. How great is our God? How awesome is he who is our Lord? And if you can recognize how awesome and great he is, if you can recognize the glorious God he is, then you must recognize he is worth living this life that he has given you, worth living it for him. 
You must recognize that everything else pales in comparison to this God. Every other pleasure and desire in this world falls infinitely short of the glorious God that we are given the opportunity to serve by him saving us. That we can serve him now and forever. So don't wait. Trust in Jesus Christ and begin to serve your great and awesome God who is your Lord. And he is your Lord. He is That right now, he reigns enthroned at the right hand of God the Father with all authority in heaven and on earth. He reigns now, and he is coming again. And he will reign on this earth, on David's throne, and he will crush all his enemies under his feet in his earthly reign. And the last enemy to be crushed will be death. And this is what Paul is, is getting to in all of this. And then in stating this, as we see in our passage, he then quotes from Psalm 8, verse 6, there in verse 27. Saying the fact that, that all of the powers and enemies will be crushed under Jesus' feet. Verse 27 says, For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. And though we don't experience it now, the day will come when everything will experience their subjection to Christ's lordship. Because God has made it so. And though everything will be in subject to God, Paul makes it very clear here that that subjection does not include God himself. Uh, Paul says that's, that's plain, that's obvious. Instead, what we read here in verse 28 concerning the transition from Christ's thousand-year reign into the eternal state, it says, when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. And so what's, what's that saying here? In other words, let's just take a broad picture to understand what, what Paul's saying. Christ will return. And he will fulfill all promises to Israel. All prophecy will be fulfilled. Christ having succeeded where Adam failed. Adam who had been given by God a mandate to rule and subdue the earth, being God's image bearer, but but failed and, and lost that in his fall into sin. Christ succeeds and he will take up that rule in his kingdom. The rule that man was intended to have. He will succeed at the mission that the Father has given him and sent him into this world for. And everything will be crushed under his feet. And when it is, then he will be subjected to the Father and hand the kingdom over to the Father. And his kingdom will be absorbed into the Father's eternal kingdom. Why? Paul says here that God may be all in all. And D.A. Carson points out that saying that this is so God may be all in all shows that the emphasis is not on God the Father alone, but on the triune God, which includes all three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So therefore, this does not mean that Christ ceases to reign, but that he will continue to reign and reign in Trinitarian unity with all three persons of the Godhead. And this must be true, because Christ must continue to reign, and his kingdom must be forever. Why must that be the case? Because Scripture says that's the case. We can look to the the prophecy about Messiah's coming in Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. And there it says, And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and tongues should serve him His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And then Luke chapter 1, verse 33 says, And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so what we see here is the eternal state is merged, is merging 
with Christ's eternal kingdom into the Father's, into Christ's earthly kingdom, into the Father's eternal kingdom, where the triune God reigns over all. And that is what we see. Even as we go to Revelation and we see the description of the eternal state, for instance, in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 3, through 3, it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the street of the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. What do we see here? The throne of God is the throne of the Lamb. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Jesus Christ. Christ will reign forever. His kingdom is forever as he reigns in Trinitarian unity with God the Father and God the Spirit over all the new creation, over the eternal state. This is our great and awesome God. And here we see our great and awesome hope, the hope for all who trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. That we have the promise of being body and soul, fit for eternity, to be with our great God, our great King, in his eternal kingdom. The great hope purchased for us, for all whom God has saved, by the substitutionary death and victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we shall all live forever, all who trust in Christ, live forever with our God. And even though we die, yet we will live. Live to never die again, because our King has died for us, and he has risen, and he lives to never die again. This is our great hope. And so, my friends, I plead with you, this is such great hope. Do not leave here without this hope. Turn from your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, and you will be saved, and you will know the guarantee of this hope that Christ has won for you because you could not win it for yourself. Christ is the victory. Christ has won it all. Christ is risen from the dead. All glory be to Christ, our risen King. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnvbc.com.